We have been looking at a series entitled Enjoy the Rest of Your Life based on the fact that we're created in God's image. And this is actually the sixth message in that series. And I'm probably going to frustrate you today because we're going to look at part of that topic, but uh, we're going to do part one today and part two next week. But, you know, we do it like the television and the networks do so that you come back and uh, you keep, keep returning. All of these are posted, incidentally, on the internet at NewAlbanyBaptist.com, and so you can find them there or on our YouTube channel. But I want to change gears a little bit today. I want to talk about a restless man who learns to rest. There's a person in the Old Testament, a book in the Old Testament, and I'm going to tell you, either it is going to depress you more, and I'm going to tell you something as a pastor. When I was in my 20s, I was trying to decide whether to go into the ministry. Uh, I was actually going to become a chiropractor. And uh, then it went from that to going to Penn State. I was all ready to go to Penn State to be a shop teacher because I liked woodworking. And God had different plans. But when I was struggling through some of this in the early days of going into the ministry, um, I was kind of depressed, to be honest with you. It'll, it'll do that to you. Uh, I'm a very, very happy guy now, but there were, some, there were some stressful times. And I probably made a mistake. I read the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's either going to depress you more, or it's going to give you um, hope for the future. But it will do one thing. It will give you a dose of reality the way life is today. And so I want to take you through the progression of Ecclesiastes and David's son Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes to see his journey because he was a very, very powerful, rich, restless individual who comes to peace. And to be honest with you, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, and you were to take out chapter 12, the last chapter, you would say to yourself, this book makes no sense whatsoever. But chapter 12 is like a key, and we won't get there till next week, but it's like a key that unlocks the door to the rest of the book. Because you've got to keep chapter 12 in perspective because it gives a uh, reality on everything else. But let's see this restless man for a moment in Ecclesiastes. I want to start with the frustrations of a restless man. You may identify with some of these. And when I say restless man, I mean man or woman. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. And we're just going to walk through this book with a number of topics. The words of the teacher, son of David, and that's how we know it's Solomon, he was the king in Jerusalem at the time. Do you remember David was not allowed to rebuild, or to build the temple, the first temple? because he was a man of war, but his son Solomon was the one who built the first temple. If you know the history of Solomon, you know something about the grace of God. What was the situation? Who was Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. That was a bad situation for David. There was no doubt. He was guilty of murder. He was guilty of adultery. And yet God in his grace gave him this son when he actually went ahead and married Bathsheba. None of it is God's ideal, but the reality is God blesses us out of the ashes. God blesses us out of the garbage, and that's, and that's just the way God is. So the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, and here's his first expression in the book. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Are you depressed yet? Wait. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Some of you who are retired, you worked all your life and you're like, this is all I have in my bank account. This is all I have from my life to, to show for it. And Solomon is relating to some of those difficulty, difficulties. If I were to have one piece of financial advice for any young person, it would be save every nickel and dime you possibly can. 
I had a grandfather, now he was never rich, he was a factory worker, but he was, we used to tease him because he was Dutch and I'm Dutch and he was pretty cheap. And back then someone would give him 10 cents for a cup of coffee and ask him to go to the vending machine in the factory and get the cup of coffee. And they'd also give, his name was David, they'd also give David 10 cents. Get yourself a cup of coffee, David. Do you know what David always did? He got the other guy the cup of coffee and he put the dime in his pocket. Okay? Uh, if, if you do that as consistently as you can, it will help. But remember, all your labor, all your toil, all you earn, and remember the, the context here, he says, under the sun. So he's not talking about a heavenly view, he's talking about everything that happens horizontally. He's talking about everything that happens in our day-to-day -day lives. And here's his conclusions. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing that ever changes. So why work so hard? We're going to get to that. Well, there's a reason to work hard and to do the right thing. But that's his frustration as he starts the book. And then he investigates a lot of different things besides work and other things. Wisdom and folly are meaningless. Chapter 1, verse 12. I, the teacher, again Solomon, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. So he wanted to search this out. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Now, remember, that's horizontal. That's under the sun. Isn't it difficult? Ever since Adam, ever since the fall in the garden, what's the reality? What did God say to Adam? You're going to have to earn your living by work, by the sweat of your brow. Do you know that work was in existence before the fall? And work was a blessing, we've talked about that. And work was not supposed to be so very difficult, but because of our brokenness and our fallenness, work has politics, work has corruption, work gets to be meaningless. And he says, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, all of them are meaningless, a chasing after wind. What happens when you chase after wind? Anybody ever hold it in their hand? Won't happen, doesn't work that way, right? You can chase and it's gone and you chase some more and it's gone and chase. What is crooked cannot be straightened. That's his view on an earthly existence. What is lacking cannot be counted. Everything in life is meaningless and a shortage. He continues, and he says, I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. Is he boasting? No, that's a fact. What did Solomon ask God for? Great wisdom. He's known for his great wisdom. I'm not sure, though, with 700 concubines and 300 wives, I'm not sure how much, a lot of those were political, but I'm not sure how much wisdom the guy actually had, if you know what I mean. I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge, and he was, he was a brilliant man. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. He wanted to see, is it better to be a wise person or to, to just be a fool bouncing through life? But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. Why? What does wisdom show you? The harsh realities of life. A fool just kind of bounces through life and they, they, they're never affected by that. The more knowledge, the more grief. Now, again, that's not in relationship to God. That's not a vertical relationship. That's a totally horizontal, if you looked at what's going on in the earth, uh, the more knowledge you have, the more frustrating things become. But he still is going to say it's better than being a fool. He is restless. He is trying to search and find himself. Chapter 2, verse 12. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom, and also, again, madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? In other words, there's nothing new under the sun. 
And I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. So on the horizontal plane, he's saying, all right, I don't want to bounce through life as a fool. I want to accomplish something. I want to have wisdom. I, it's better. With wisdom comes grief. With wisdom comes some disappointment. But it's not near as disappointing as living as a fool. That's what he's saying. The wise have eyes in their heads, while the fool walks in darkness. It's like this zombified fool just walking around, not knowing where he's going, not knowing what he's doing. Then I said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. In a horizontal plane on earth, guess what? The wise person dies. The fool dies. Are you depressed yet? That's the reality of life. And if you let it get to you, Solomon is saying, you're going to have a hard time resting. You're going to be a restless person. And life is going to take a bitter, bitter turn for you. So you got to hang on because he's going to get to a much, much better perspective. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. In other words, I'm going to die even if I'm a wise man. What then do I gain by being wise? And I said to myself, this too is meaningless. Now this is without a relationship with God at this point. This is a restless man who is seeking a relationship with God, but he hasn't put God in the equation yet. He's still dealing with what I looked at on earth. Everybody dies. What's the difference if you bumble through as a fool or you become a wise man? It's all restless. And then he moved over to pleasures. And he said, pleasures are meaningless. Wisdom, folly, it's meaningless. Pleasure is meaningless. Isn't this our culture? We live for pleasure. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. God built pleasure into our world. It's part of what we do. You know, you look at the, the sunrise, the sunset. That's a very pleasing experience. You know, you watch your children, your grandchildren. That's a very pleasing experience. Uh, you relax and, and, and kind of cruise and kick up your heels. And, and that's a good thing. That's part of life. But he says, if you're pursuing it to give you meaning in life, it's going to come up empty. I said to myself, chapter 2, verse 1, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. And did Solomon go after the pleasure? But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. So don't any of you laugh, okay? If I tell a pun or a joke, don't laugh, because if you do, you'll be on the edge of madness, and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> Thank you, dear. She always, she tells the youth group, when he says a pun or cracks a joke, don't laugh because it only encourages him. So, but what he said, you know, to, to drink and relax and have laughter and have fun in life. And there are people that all they do is live for fun. And he says, that too becomes madness because it doesn't take you anywhere in life. What does pleasure accomplish? And he said, I tried cheering myself with wine. He went to drinking. Now, there's nothing wrong with someone having a glass of wine. There is something wrong, according to Ephesians, if that controls you, if that is what you're doing. And this is what he's talking about. I basically went out, and I partied, and I got drunk, and I tried cheering myself with wine. Well, you know, alcohol just depresses you, for the most part. Um, like I say, there's nothing wrong with it in balance. There's something wrong with it when it's out of balance. And embracing folly. I, I'm just going to be the life of the party. I'm going to have a great time. Uh, I'm going to embrace folly. My mind is still guiding me with wisdom. Now, I don't know how that works. You might know how that works. But uh, if you are trying pleasure and if you are embracing folly, there were times in Solomon's life, I'm not sure his mind was guiding him with wisdom. Uh, he, made, he made, like his father David, he made some major mistakes, like all of us do, and the grace of God comes in. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So this is what he tried. So you know, this is the kind of mentality that says, I work my job for the weekend. 
so that I can get to the weekend and I can blow off all the steam and I just and I just I just want to I just want to party and relax and it's one of the problems that that we particularly have for young people there are warnings in Ecclesiastes of, and we'll get to it at the end of the book about you know what you do with your youth and then you get older and you regret what you did with your youth and there are some of us that are in that situation there are things that i regret i did in my youth i would never do as as an adult or never even consider he said but i wanted to see what was good for people to do in this pleasure area all the days of their life and then he goes to excessive work again and he says there's nothing wrong with work but excessive work is meaningless if you're a workaholic that's a problem Chapter 2, verse 4, I understood great pro I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. In other words, he was going to do this so that it gave him some meaning in life. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves and flourishing trees. He was industrious. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Can you imagine that statement? Nothing my eyes desired did I deny myself. Does that sound like our current self-gratifying generation? Yep. You know what counts? What counts is what satisfies me. What counts is what makes a difference with me. And to talk to people about discipline, to talk to people about immediate gratification and delaying gratification so you have something better is like talking a foreign language to some in the younger generation. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Why? Because he couldn't take it with him. Because death was going to be the great separator. It is depressing to live life horizontally in our world without God. I don't know how people do it. It makes no sense whatsoever. And yet people manage to lie to themselves. They say, well, my, my career, my education, my toil, my bank account, my credentials, my family, that's what feeds everything. And there's nothing wrong with that feeding everything and giving you a sense of satisfaction if it's in perspective. But if it's not in perspective, you will become a restless man or woman because none of that was intended to satisfy because only the creator is intended to satisfy ultimately. And then all of those things like a puzzle fall into place. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Now this is a very extreme view. Chapter 2, verse 17. So I hated life. That's depression. I think Solomon went through a tough time of depression. I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. Do you ever, do you ever try to buy something? You know, maybe you're going on Amazon, and I just looked up, Jeff Bezos is still the richest man in the world, and you made him that way, uh, and I made him that way. What are you gonna do? I get frustrated, I go to Walmart to buy something, and they don't have it anymore, and you complain about the box stores, but you end up going online because there the stuff is. Well, here's what's taking place. Did you ever buy something, order something, you get it, and then you get instant buyer's remorse? You're like looking at it like, oh, wow. I thought that thing would satisfy. I thought that thing would, you know, and it's okay if it's a tool that you need to do the trick, but the mentality that says this is going to fill a void in my life, you know? Um, I would have 20 motorcycles if I thought that it would fill a void in my life, but I know that it won't. And who knows? Oh, wait. I hated all the things that I toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. I love this. 
and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. So if you leave it to your children or you leave it to somebody else or the government, who knows how they're going to deal with those resources. And that was a big regret for him. That made him restless. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair. If that's not depression, I don't know what it is. Over all my toilsome labor over the sun. So what is he saying? He's saying work can be meaningless. Pleasure can be meaningless. Wisdom can be meaningless. Folly can be meaningless. Verse 22 of chapter, 21 of chapter 2. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. They are restless. This too is meaningless. Now, I hope you're not at that state, particularly as a Christian. But there are many, many people in our world that they are trying to plug things in to avoid, and it's not working because you and I were meant for Jesus Christ and our Creator. Now, the light begins to shine on Solomon. A restless man begins to see the path to rest. Look at some of his conclusions. Chapter 2, verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. So he says, I'm going to work anyway, even if I have to leave it to a fool. There's something satisfying about looking at what I do and finding satisfaction in it. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. So he's beginning to see this glimmer of rest that says, you know what? There's something more than the horizontal. There's the vertical with God. And maybe God gave work to satisfy something in our hearts and our souls. And he says, for without him, without God, who could eat or find enjoyment? So he's starting to see this glimmer of a key that says, my enjoyment in life is doing the things horizontally in life that connect me vertically to God. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. So he's talking about a relationship with God. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. So he's saying God's going to reward the godly in the future. And everything that people who rejected God think they've accumulated is going to be handed off to God's righteous people, people who have followed and walked with Christ in his kingdom. Handed over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, and again, a chasing after wind, unless you have that vertical relationship. Chapter 3, verse 9. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything, again, a glimmer of hope, of rest, he has made everything beautiful in its time. So work is beautiful. Pleasure is beautiful in the right context. Family is beautiful. Friends are beautiful. He also set eternity in the human heart. Here's part of the glimmer. What did God do? God takes the toil, God takes the wisdom, he takes the folly, he takes everything we're doing in life, and he begins to say, he begins to whisper from our heart, there's more, there's more, you're an eternal being. You were created in God's image for eternity. And he says, God set that eternity in your heart, now are you going to go seek it? And that's the big problem, because most of our society just settles for what? I'll find satisfaction in my toil. I'll find satisfaction in my work. I'll find satisfaction in my pleasure. I'll find satisfaction in my family. And it's all in this horizontal plane. And there's something eating at them inside that says, you know what? The grave's going to end all of this. What in the world am I doing? So they'll lie to themselves. You and I have done that before we became Christians. We sometimes may still do it. We'll lie to ourselves and say, okay, this next thing that I'm going to do is going to satisfy. 
And he says it never, never was intended to because God put eternity in our heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God is inscrutable. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy. Here's that glimmer of rest. And to do good while they live. But you're going to be depressed doing that if you don't have God's perspective. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift from God. There's the whole package. When you look at these things, not just on the horizontal level, but that life is a gift from God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God does it so that people will fear him. God does it so people will respond to him because eternity is set in their heart. Do you know, the older people, the older a person gets, and I thought about this. I did a, a, a renewal of vows over the weekend for a couple I married 10 years ago. And I said to them, come back in 10 years. And then I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm going to be 78 in 10 years. I'm going to go up to that place where they're having their revows with my walker. I hope not. But, you know, and, and then you, you get to a certain age where death becomes a reality. And there are people who just absolutely fear death. But if you're a Christian, we shouldn't have. It's okay to have a fear about how you will die or whether you will suffer. That's sort of a painful thing. But the fact that you're going to die as a Christian, you know where you're going. And this whole thing is a gift of God because eternity is set in our hearts. Here's one for our day, for our society. Justice and fairness can be meaningless. Now he's going from a rest position and he's looking at the horizontal society again and he's saying pleasure doesn't satisfy unless it's from God. Work doesn't satisfy unless it's from God. Family doesn't satisfy. Whatever. He said, I tried wine, I tried wisdom, I tried women, I tried everything, and nothing satisfies unless it's seen through God's grid. And then he comes to society, and he says, justice and fairness can be meaningless. Chapter 3, verse 16, and I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. Does it look like you just turned on your television? My goodness. Absolutely. Isn't that what you're seeing? Isaiah says the time will come, and we're there, when the truth will be called a lie, and the lie will be called the truth. That's how upside down our society will be. Justice and fairness can be meaningless. And a certain meaninglessness of civil society, it can make someone more restless. If you were to turn on the news, I know people who say, I don't even watch the news anymore. I can't. And that's okay. I'm just so nosy, I have to see it, you know? But look what he says, chapter 7. We're going to jump up there and we'll come back to it next week. Chapter 7, verse 29. This only have I found. God created mankind upright. So the original creation was good, even with the fall. But they have gone in search of many schemes. So what happens is people want to get away from God. They don't want to give God his, their due, his due. And they say, you know what? I'd rather scheme through life myself. I'll figure it out. I don't need you, God. That, that was the age-old thing of the Tower of Babel. I don't need you, God. But look at this one. This is one of my favorites, chapter 8 and verse 11. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. Wow, is that our justice system today? Let's let people out without any bail. People who have committed five, six, seven crimes. And let's not execute any sentence for those crimes and see if crime goes up or if it goes down. Now, the average person in the population knows the answer to that question. Why don't our politicians know the answer? Why don't our judges 
know the answer. And if they know the answer, they just may not care. That might be part of the problem. But this is what's happening in our society. When a sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. It's going to increase. You know why? Because I can get away with it. I can get away with it. That's what they say to themselves. And that makes a man more restless. That makes a society more restless. A restless man learns to be at rest with reality in his culture. Chapter 3, verse 19, we're coming back. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of animals. Here's the reality. The same fate animals awaits both of them. Await, the same fate awaits both of them. As one dies, so does the other. So he says, you know, animals die, people die. All have the same breath. Not exactly, but horizontally looking at it, you would make that deduction. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Now, this is a picture without God. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Now, we know the answer to that as Christians, that your spirit goes to be with Christ. But he's not talking about a relationship with God here. He's talking about what he observes on earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? So he's dealing with reality and he says, okay, I can even rest with this ugly reality, but he's still got to move on to dealing with God. Chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed and that they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors. Isn't this the, the story around the world? And they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living. Now, that's not necessarily true, but that's his perspective on the horizontal plane are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. So he's saying it, it was better that nobody was ever even born. That's pretty extreme. That's pretty depressed. And I saw that all toil and all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. There's competition, there's envy, there's jealousy. This too is meaningless in the chasing after wind. So he's talking about bad competition in the world, unfair competition. And then he goes to another topic. You know, he's done pleasure, wisdom, folly, work, drinking, friendliness, Friendlessness and loneliness rob life of meaning. Chapter 4, verse 7. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? So this is a workaholic. This too is meaningless, a miserable business. He's saying that there are people who are out there, they have no other relatives, and they just keep working for what? To accumulate. And he says riches are meaningless. Chapter 5, verse 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things, for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. That's where that statement comes from. How much more do you need? Well, just a little more. Well, when you get that, how much more do you need? Well, just a little more. Whoever loves money never has enough. The problem is loving money instead of loving people. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. So he's saying all of these things in life can make you restless. Chapter 5, verse 13. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, 
or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and everyone, as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. You know the old adage, you never will see a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse taking the stuff with them because it doesn't happen. Now, if you're not depressed, you should be. But the good news is that in a vertical relationship with God, this restless man gets closer to rest and perspective. 518, this is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, to find satisfaction, in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. You gotta understand that the only way you can be rest, restful is understanding that God is the giver of life, for that's their life. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. Whether you like it or agree with it or not, as an American, you are richer than 95% of the world's population. We don't feel that way, but that's the reality. This is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. You notice it doesn't say glad, occupied with wealth. Occupied with gladness of heart. It's a relationship. So this restless man is getting closer to rest. Next week, we're going to come to the conclusion in chapter 12 of what the key is for this kind of rest. 